I don't think I really feel any anger. You know, what I feel is regret at how, um, one personal story that I'll tell you is a very good friend, probably one of my best friends in this, uh, had moved to Toronto and we were always in touch. We got together from time to time. And then as time goes on, you kind of, you know, your contacts kind of broadens and you don't see them as much. And one night, um, my phone rang and it was my friend and there, there was a lot of people in my apartment and he just called to say hi and basically i said hi great to hear from you and i said uh wow like are you still alive meaning i haven't heard from you in a while and i can't talk to you right now because there's a bunch of people here so can i call you back and he said sure so i hung up i didn't call him back and about a week later i heard that he had died and I realized that he was calling to say goodbye. And I had, I said, are you still alive? Not even knowing that he was sick. Like I didn't know that he had AIDS. Uh, so that's just like a personal instance, but it, it still really haunts me actually. Patient Zero is the name doctors and the medical detectives use to describe this man, the airline steward, to protect his identity. I have spoken of Patient Zero to people who weren't around at that time, and when they realized that who I'm talking about, and that I actually knew that person, and that there was a, a real person rather than, you know, somebody eight foot tall dripping blood from the mouth, it was, yeah, it's as if I'm talking about having known Joan of Arc personally. The man was Gaetan Dugas, a 32-year-old Air Canada steward from Quebec who died in 1984. None of the straight people that I've talked to even know what Patient Zero was. They didn't know who Patient Zero was or what it was, which is not the case with gay people. I mean, if you're gay, you know Patient Zero. Patient Zero was a man, a central victim and victimizer. The most widespread part is the idea that this is the man who introduced AIDS to North America. I don't know whether he actually brought the epidemic to the country, but he certainly was the person who spread it from one end of the country to the other. There is just so much wrong about the concept of a patient zero. The second part is that not only did he cause the epidemic by being the first case, but he was somehow doing it deliberately, that he was trying to spread his infection far and wide across the United States and beyond. He reportedly crisscrossed North America, feeding an enormous homosexual appetite with hundreds of liaisons. This uh, sort of golden man-child, if you will. A very handsome airline steward. And suddenly to die on the front page like that. Zuba's family would only say that parts of the story are false that only God knows the truth. It's funny to say, Gaetan always used to say to me, one day I'll be a star. Well, <laughs> he might be a star now, you know, like, he got, I mean, he was known, like, people knew him, but I don't think that's what he meant when he said, one day I'll be a star, darling, okay. <laughs> I was a friend of Gaetan. Gaetan was something different. A man on the glittering edge, flamboyantly and defiantly and happily gay, seemingly unconcerned about what others thought. My name is Gaetan with an E at the end, it makes me a little bit different than Gaetan. 
Well, I grew up in Montreal, and he grew up in Quebec City, so we uh, we had the same French humor, if you want. You know, it's, we always blame the other one because uh, we're both blonde. <laughs> and, uh, which Gaetan or Gaetan? No, 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 it's Gaetan. C'est pas Gaetan. Moi, je suis Gaetan. Non, c'est Gaetan. <laughs> he was adopted, and I believe he had five sisters, and they just hovered over him. They just loved him. But that's about the extent of the family I know. Whatever uh, prejudice I had going into the house, you know, expecting who are these people to have raised this monster, was... Um, sort of uh, immediately shredded when I caught sight of the fridge door and this prayer card for Gaetan. In French, there was, uh, you know, in memory of, of Gaetan Dugard, uh, our beloved son. The love, uh, there was so much love in that one little gesture on the fridge door. I don't know when he came out to his family, but I believe his family knew for a long time and they were very supportive. Unfortunately, not all the men I worked with had that experience. Um, at least one supervisor I worked with who started as a flight attendant, his family disowned him when he came out and he never spoke to them again, it's to the best of my knowledge. Growing up gay in the late 60s, early 70s was unspeakable, it was something you couldn't talk about, confide even in your closest friends. When you live in a culture that tells you your very innate self is wrong, you're a perfect bullying victim. Growing up, I had no idea whatsoever anything about gayness, gay people, homosexuals. If you were a young kid, even a child, some people were children, in say the 50s or the 60s, perhaps before, but I'm not that old, and you noticed in yourself, you know, that you were gay or were a f you fearfully suspected it, there was no place to find out about it. It didn't exist in the popular culture at all. I never was remotely aware of being gay. I had very intense friendships with other girls, but I never really put, you know, five and five together, let alone two and two. You know, growing up in a, a you know, a Chinese, old fashioned Chinese family, you, you just didn't talk about it, you didn't learn about it or anything like that. And you like to play, you know, um, skipping and jump rope and things like that rather than baseball. When I was probably eight or nine, two gay guys moved into our, onto our street. They bought a house and moved onto our street. And everybody was sort of giggling about one liked to garden and one liked to paint. And so it was one of those things that was sort of, you know, really embedded on my mind that that was not something that was a good thing. I remember looking up the word homosexuality and it said something about extreme, you know, extreme perversion and depraved and all that. But I remember how thrilled I was to discover that I existed. It was really, uh, it was sort of strange where you would gather up your sense of self-worth or who and what you were. And when there were images, they were really incredibly negative. I do remember Diamonds Are Forever. I remember seeing that as a teenager with my parents at the musical theater on Tremont Street in Boston and being absolutely mortified by the very creepy uh, queer villains and sitting there with my parents and uh, listening to people sort of laugh at the at these uh, was pretty awful. 1967 CBS had a documentary I remember watching that was just so homophobic and hateful and uh, really. The Homosexuals with CBS News correspondent Mike Wallace. Americans consider homosexuality more harmful to society than adultery abortion, or prostitution. So they actually got a real-life homosexual to speak on camera, but they backlit him and uh, changed the voice so that no one would see who they were. And so that was my first introduction to know that there were these strange creatures called homosexuals, but they were obviously so disgusting that they could not possibly appear on television. This man is 27. He was unable to hold a job because of his inability to contain his homosexual inclinations. He's been in jail three times for committing homosexual acts. If he is arrested once more, he faces the possibility of life in prison. Uh, I know that inside now I'm sick. I'm not sick just sexually. I'm sick in a lot of ways. It was on a little bit later at night. It was close to my bedtime. And I remember my parents watching it. And I remember wanting to hear everything that was being said. 
but afraid that if I looked too attentive, there would be something suspicious. And it was scary. From what I heard and what I could listen to, and from what little I saw, I remember thinking, this is bad, this is terrible, this is, you know, this is really not a way to live one's life. The average homosexual is promiscuous. He is not interested in nor capable of a lasting relationship like that of a heterosexual marriage. His sex life, his love life, consists of a series of chance encounters at the clubs and bars he inhabits. I mean, I remember myself thinking in the late 50s when I wasn't sure, you know, what was going on with me. Um, I decided it was a phase I was going through and I would just enjoy it. And if I was still gay when I graduated from college, I would just commit suicide. I was living in an all-male dorm, and it was like gym class around the clock. You know, did you catch that game last night? I mean, I didn't even know what sport they were referring to. The guys on my floor realized I was gay, and I just, I just, like, had a breakdown. I went up on the roof of the high-rise dorm. I actually thought about jumping off. We didn't want to be, well, I sure did not want to be flamboyant. I was holding back all the time because you didn't want to come across as being that way, so. I preferred to not be perceived as being gay. Somehow I got the impression that I, I, I would be treated better that way, where gay talk was already so obvious that he must have dealt with that by just being even more glowing. Because he would have been obvious as a gay person. Uh, I thought it was very brave of him. He's never, he was not holding back anything. He was ahead of his time in a way. He was. He was who he was, and he didn't pretend to be straight. Uh, some of the men I worked with passed. He didn't, uh, he didn't really pretend anything. Um, internalized homophobia was a given. It would be like, if you talked about, if you talk about any minority, blacks or women, if you just scratch, or Jews, if you scratch the surface, you will discover a lot of internalized prejudice. I remember having a boyfriend who had, again, such internalized homophobia that he said to me at one point, I think that there's, I think the worst thing that can happen to somebody is being gay. It was one of those relationships where I realized there was no possibility of that working out because if he didn't love what was an integral part of him, how could he love somebody who represented that? Well, I, I'm reminded of Paul Manette and his, his, his thesis that we all make fine concierges, that there's a, something about a gay man and, or a gay woman that wants to please others, um, is still ser searching for a level of acceptance and um, understanding that is always sometimes seems to be just just outside of their grasp. Coming of age in the 60s and 70s, there was a constant message out there, a negative message that two gay men couldn't love each other. I mean, it was considered a joke. It was considered unworkable. It was considered a fantasy. And that pernicious lie that gets woven into your psyche and into your being um, kind of contributed to the kind of lifestyle that led to these rising epidemics of STDs. But underneath it all, there is that message, you know, that two men together is just, as one expert said, one penis plus one penis equals nothing, as if we're always reduced to our sexuality instead of our humanity. People who are young do not understand in any real way, even if they know the fact, homosexuality was against the law. It was against the law, not just your parents didn't like you, you know, or your, you know, people you went to school with didn't like you. It was actually a crime. There was a special squad of police who used to hang out in public washrooms looking for gay behavior and then arresting people who exhibited it. And those names and numbers would go in the paper. We were warned about who, who to speak to. Uh, if the guys were too good looking, 
they were possibly cops who were in there um, to pick you up and then beat you up, take them down to uh, one of the beaches and basically leave them there beat up, which was kind of a, you know, a regular weekend happening. If you were found out, I mean, a lot of people kind of, people kind of knew if you played the game right, you'd be okay. But if you affirmed or asserted yourself or pushed in any way, shape or form, lose your job like that. You lose your job anyway without doing that. There were no civil liberties protections of any kind. Stonewall was like a thunderclap. The fact that gays had fought back was astonishing to me. There was a generation of young gay people who were more militarized. They weren't content with, oh, well, you really shouldn't be raiding uh, gay bars, you shouldn't be arresting drag queens. When it yet again got raided by the police, the patrons decided enough is enough. We're not gonna put up with this anymore. And there was what's referred to as the Stonewall Riots. And that for most, certainly gay men, um, marks the beginning of the gay liberation movement. Gay Tendu Gras epitomized a politic of a deep pleasure in the community we built up out of Stonewall against the odds, against the Anita Bryants, against the rise of the Reagan right. I love homosexuals, if you can believe that. I love them enough to tell them the truth because I know that there is hope for the homosexuals that if they're willing to uh, turn from uh, sin, the same as any individual, that, uh, that they can be ex-homosexuals, the same as there can be an ex-murderer, an ex-thief, or ex-anybody. <laughs> We had a crew lounge where we had to check in all the time. And they were, everybody was talking about Gaeta, how beautiful it was, and so on. So I was obviously curious to see. And one day I was in the comm center and I saw him, big smile, and we clicked right away. We, we were friends instantly. I appreciated working with Gaetan because I didn't have to follow him around. I didn't have to say, well, you know, this is how we're supposed to do it. Why are you taking shortcuts? Working for an airline was really a good home for, for gay, gay guys, gay people, lesbian, um, because they were extremely, extremely good workers. Of course, the airline, they were not blind to all this. They hired a lot of gay people. In fact, I would say at the time, it must have been at least 75%, 80% of the guys were gay. Word was out, at least among the gay people, and probably even more around the straight people, that here was this, you know, uh, outrageous gay guy, um, you know, who, um, well, outrageous gay guy. Oh yes, that was Gaetan's attitude, yeah, like, you know, he doesn't have a problem about being gay. You do, so deal with it. He even had this shirt adjusted tight, 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 which was not the, the airline rule, but he, you know, he, and his pants were so tight, you could see everything, basically. I would say he was more than fairly. <laughs> and he was incredibly flamboyant. He loved eyeshadows, a little bit of blue or purple, and he um, also had the um, uh, mascara. How do you describe charisma, you know? But yes, he walked down the hall and you could see him stand out, you know? But he was very kind of, uh, you know, he flowed. But a great personality, you could tell right away, very smiling and joking right away. Both of us, we used to color our hair the same color, and we'd do it on his couch watching The Young and the Restless. I did get a white Corvette. Well, he said, oh, we must go for a ride, we must go for a ride, so we did. And you, you'd think that Gaetan would sit down in the passenger seat and that's it? No, he was sitting in the back, the moment we got to Young Street, waving at the people, and I said, 
I don't care, you know. Everybody was laughing in a way or waving. Actually, I've got copies of those pictures right here. And oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, and one so you, you, can, you see one? Can you? Can uh, in my, in the white Corvette. <laughs> my best friend that died from AIDS, Erisha McDonald. Yeah. He's right there. He was with Gaetan at the time. Hairdresser in New Yorkville. The sweetest man, French Canadian again. That was a good time because there was, was AIDS around at the time. I don't know, but there was no worry. We were having fun. The 70s were just fabulous. Um, you know, not only was all, there was all this sex, and there was all, this, all these drugs going around, and we didn't yet know that drugs were really not a good idea. You know, it is true that you could not believe what New York was like back then. You know, people would be, I would be like walking on the street with a friend of mine, a, a man who's gay, and it, I would be talking to him, and then he would be gone. You know, he would be like, he saw someone in the street, they looked at each other, they left. All through the 70s, sex was kind of the gay man's obligation. You had to prove that you were a gay man by having as much sex as possible because this was gay liberation. And so I remember being introduced to Gaetan. We didn't really click. And I, I can tell you why is because Gaetan was a much more sexually adventurous person than I ever was. He was really... I think the first gay man that went out and said, this is my lifestyle. And I remember saying to the straight guy who I didn't know, are you telling me that if there was a street in New York filled with beautiful 20-year-old girls who you could just look at and take into a doorway or something that you wouldn't do it? You would do it. You just can't do it because women won't do it. I mean, a small price to pay for owning the world, I would say. Being in a queer club or just a disco club early on, once you make it, you know, in the door, past the doorman, there's liberation on the dance floor. What it was was anonymous. You did not know the name of the person, which meant you did not know whether this person was a truck driver, you know, or vice president of Chase Bank. Because we thought that sex was good for you. Like, Cal. Like, New York was... It, it, in orgy, I don't even know how to describe it. And, uh, and to me, it seemed like you couldn't possibly have sex with too many different people. What could be healthier? What could be more delightful? Feminists were celebrating and reclaiming clitoral orgasm as, as central to women's sexuality. It was as if gay men were busy discovering that the other half of their dick was inside their rectum. It was a golden age, wow. Well. Oh, it was. Yeah, golden age. How was it like, well, in the 70s? Kind of fun, kind of great, right? I mean, you know. The bathhouses were meeting places. That's where you met people. You went dancing, and then you went to the bathhouse, you know. You're probably aware that the Continental Baths had Bette Midler. No one had to say, oh, this is Rock Hudson Call. We would walk him around to the booths and shove him in a booth, and you could hear someone go, oh, my God, it's Rock Hudson. <laughs> Elton John is right there, and he's dancing right beside it. Calvin Klein recently in the New York Times made a comment saying that the three great decades of the 20th century were Berlin in the 20s, Paris in the 30s, and New York City in the 70s. And I, I agree with him. They had discotheques, and yes, gay discotheques everywhere. London, New York, San Francisco, all these places that we flew to. And I got very clearly, I think, that uh, Gaetan liked having encounters that were no responsibility. Sliding his business card, or the, or they were coming from passengers. Gaetan had said, hey, "Did you notice the, the guy in such and such a seat? Cute. I bet you I can make more time with him than you can," uh, which often was true. This guy is definitely straight. There's no way Gaetan. Well, you know, he's going to do anything with him, but the passenger goes. It was more important to have a party for him, obviously. But it was such a revelation uh, to discover that 
that anal sex could be pleasurable and clean. I mean, it was kind of an acquired taste. You didn't just, usually you didn't jump into it. There was a whole subculture that went with learning how to bottom, learning how to relax, learning how to douche, learning how to open up. You know, it wasn't just about sex. It was about men loving men. It was about seeing other gay men as your brother and caring about them and making love to them and being tender with them and affectionate with them and having relationships with them. Gaetan actually told me that he had a project of having sex with a different man every night. It was uh, just kind of an entertainment. Like it, it was a project he worked on with great uh, intensity and effort and success. Well, you know, if you scored, say, two nights a week, and you did that for a year, that's 100 people. So from 71 to 81, that's 1,000 people. Your average gay man probably had sex with 1,000 people in that decade. And I'm sure Guitard Dugas had sex with many more than 1,000 people. Oh, yes. He was an extremely sexual man. He was always ready, always ready, OK? He never knew. I was going to work, and he had his backpack. And uh, there was a something in the backpack, and it fell. So I said, oh, what's that? Mon <gasps> lubricant. I can't go anywhere without that. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so he picked it up right away and put it in his pocket. Like, was he sexual? I would say so. Sex, drugs, disco. Uh, a sex. But as the 70s wore on, and the commercialization of gay male sex exploded, you no longer had to care about the movement. You could just come in, get your rocks off and go, and it didn't really force you to um, think politically about um, this being an opportunity for America to move forward in terms of its empathy and understanding and bridging all these divides that the culture creates to keep us apart instead of united. You know, it's very easy to fall into the hedonistic side because it's intoxicating, but there was a price to pay, I think, for that. You could see from the lifestyle of New York that candles were being burned at both ends. Yeah, it's great fun. But if it was a lifestyle, uh, it was going to burn out. Young men, full of testosterone and opportunity. Something was likely to happen. A friend of mine called from... The other side of San Francisco Bay. He was straight, and then he said, hey, have you heard about the new gay cancer? Ha ha, there's a gay cancer out there. I thought, that, no, that's crazy. Being gay has nothing to do with cancer. Um, and then it just got awful. It got worse and worse and worse from that moment on. I wish I'd never heard that term gay cancer. This is very early 81. There's something going on. Uh, there's some people in the New York City emergency rooms with gay men and, you know, who were seriously ill. And uh, within a week or so, there were a couple of deaths reported. I had referred a man with a rash, gay man with a peculiar sort of rash, to my consultant dermatologist. And he phoned me back to postulate to me, isn't it a little strange, the, all these very strange rashes that we've started seeing in gay men? I remember the first person I knew who had AIDS, but no one knew what he had. And he died. I was so shocked. You know, what did he die of? Because we were too young to be dying. Reading the newspaper that morning, there was the famous little paragraph, eight New Yorkers died of mysterious gay cancer, and word was filtering from Fire Island, the whispers had begun. There were a lot of gay men coming to my practice who had unexplained lymphadenopathy. And lymphadenopathy is swelling of lymph glands. It could be in the neck, under the arms. And there was no easy explanation for it, as well as this peculiar occurrence of pneumocystis carinii pneumonia in gay men in San Francisco and Los Angeles. We began to realize that this wasn't just a crazy homophobic media story. There was something serious going on here. I was totally paranoid and scared shitless. I was in a state of perpetual paranoia. And so was everybody. Everybody thought, oh my god, I've got it. So this young nurse 
had been admitted to the hospital the night before uh, in September of that year, came to my office with a purple spot on the bottom of each foot. And biopsy showed that it was Kaposi sarcoma. Kaposi sarcoma had been recognized as a very rare form of skin cancer. Um, little reddish or purplish lumps appearing on the skin, uh, often on the feet, and um, mostly seeming to affect older men. Normally there are fewer than 20 cases of Kaposi a year in the United States, but in the last 18 months more than 300 cases have been reported. The Kaposi sarcoma that was affecting the younger gay men as part of this emergent new condition of, that became known as AIDS was far more aggressive, far more disseminated. The, the thing about it that sort of vaguely got my attention was the idea that it was an infectious cancer because there aren't any infectious cancers, by and large. Well, there are some cases of something we don't really know yet what it is. They, they all seem to have immune deficiency. We have no idea what's causing it. Is this a something, okay? Is this something we should all know about? I'm beginning to, to kind of come to terms with, with that. I remember in San Francisco, people called it gay waiter's disease. But of course, I mean, gay waiter was like a redundant phrase in San Francisco. A lot of people got it, bang, 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 with the airline mostly. We were all over the place. It's, it's, it's hard to explain how you feel at a time where you can die if you do what. I don't know. It was a, a time when we didn't stop partying and having sex because that connection hadn't been made. But there was an unease in the gay community about did we actually dare go out you know, into a club and uh, you know breathe the air from all these gay people. It's a bit difficult in the sense of sometimes you need to know what you're looking for in order to find it. And when you really don't know what it is, it becomes that much harder to find. You didn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that this was going to be a problem when you saw two cases and then four cases and then eight cases I mean, that's an exponential growth. My hunch at the time was that this was going to be an epidemic. And unfortunately, my hunch was right. I think when we realized what a big epidemic it was, it became very frightening. You know, how is this going to end? I remember talking to a very prominent virologist in Boston who said, what if it becomes airborne? And I, all I could say is everybody will die. It was a terrible period because of the uncertainty. You don't know exactly how is it transmitted. Am I infected with a, a death sentence here? There, there were all sorts of weird theories. Uh, the, the most common was poppers. Poppers are wonderful. <laughs> they make you feel a sense of euphoria. They're basically vasodilators. They give you they give you a quick high, and uh, they were being used a lot amongst gay men. And everybody was praying that it was going to be poppers, you know, because we could give up poppers, or it was going to be S and M, or it was going to be fisting, or it was going to be something we could give up. Gay men were getting a lot of infections at that time, hepatitis and amoebas and whatnot, and it was thought that they were overloading their immune systems, and this what you were seeing with AIDS, which was clearly an immune system disease, was the result of this overload. Was this the CIA? Was this an urban myth? Let's, let's ignore it at all costs, because it's, it's got to be a, it's got to be a right-wing plot. And certainly the right-wing exploited it and demonized us in, in exactly that way. So it's very understandable that people like myself or Gaetan would plug our ears somewhat especially in the early years, even as we started to see friends getting sick and friends dying. Throughout the summer of 1981, we recorded interviews from AIDS cases. We're struck by how sick they were, also about their lifestyles, that they tended to be very sexually active gay men, traveled a lot, used a lot of drugs, but we didn't know what the risk factors were, so we developed a case definition distributed to doctors, health departments, teaching hospitals and asked cases we reported to health departments and then to CDC. 
Bill Darrow was a, a research sociologist uh, in the STD division and an expert on sexual behavior, uh, both in gay men and in heterosexual populations. We get this report that three men in Los Angeles are, all, are in the same hospital, they apparently have the same condition, and the lover of one of these men says, and the three have had sex with one another. This suggests that it's not poppers, you know, he didn't say that they were sniffing the same substance, that they had sex with one another. That's when the question came, well, are there any other sexual connections in Los Angeles? Let's have Bill Darrow fly out to Los Angeles and pursue the possibility of a cluster of cases connected by sexual contact within the last five years. So the first patient that came in was actually a flight attendant. And um, he, he said that, you know, um, one of my sex partners has been this very attractive steward who flies for Air Canada. Handsome guy, really nice guy. And I've had sex with him. Can you tell me any more about him? Well, he kind of has an accent. Um, can't remember his name. In the afternoon, we talked to a second person and gave a very similar story. We had to drive all the way out to Orange County to interview this third person. And we got around to this business of naming sex partners, and here comes this same French-Canadian flight attendant. Can you remember his name? He said, you know, I think I've got a card or some information in my address book. Let me, let me go see if I can find it. So he excused himself, he went into his bedroom, and he came back with a big smile on his face. I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. Here's his name. I had sex with him on Thanksgiving, 8709 Club, and afterwards I came down with hepatitis. And then he came back in December, I had sex with him again, and I bet that's when I got this disease that I've got now. What's his name? He says, here it is. Dugas had experienced fever and noticed swollen lymph nodes since January 1980. When I met him, he had two visible spots of chaos, visible when he's wearing clothing. One was on his forearm, and one was on the tip of his nose. The CDC numbered the cases in the order in which they came to the attention of CDC, the order in which they were reported. So there had to have been 56 other people reported to us before he would re report it to us. And so that's how I found out more about him, and then I followed up by calling him and introducing myself, and lo and behold, you know, before anything else happens, I'm meeting him in New York. I'm flying up to New York the next week. There was certainly a lot of fear because there was still a lot that was unknown about it, and so I had no idea what the impact was going to be on me um, as a result of having had sex with Gaetan, so uh, we were just a, a group of us all had just gone out to uh, to a tea dance in the afternoon, and he was a friend of a friend of mine, and one thing led to another, and we ended up going home together. He was very full of life. He was charming. Um, he just had a lot of fun, a lot of energy. Yeah, it was definitely risky. I was I bottomed for him. So a week after we had. Um, gone home together, I was talking with this mutual friend of ours, and I was saying, you know, he seemed like a really nice guy, and he said, oh yeah, he's got that weird gay cancer. And I was like, what gay cancer? I'd never heard of it. It was the first sort of time that anybody had even referenced something like that. And I sort of let it drop, and then um, I started to hear a little bit more about it, and then I started to see uh, news about it. And so that became much more, again, embedded in my mind, and it was something that started to really impact my thought process. This was something um, with the potential to impact our community and, and, and other communities in, in much bigger ways. And so suddenly all of these boys who had had to hide who they were for years and pretend they weren't and deny to their parents that they were gay and they weren't married because they were bachelors. We don't have bachelors anymore. Suddenly they could be who they were. And now we had a disease come along and say, you can't do that. We had finally found our moment in time where we could have sex, where we could have affairs, we could do what we wanted. Finally, and no one could say, no, you can't do that anymore. 
and to have AIDS crash into that party. Oh my goodness. So you had on the one hand this gay sexual liberation and and people really experiencing what it was like to be gay in a way they'd never been able to do before and a move to the right from a government standpoint. It was a perfect storm because it allowed that group to come in and say, this is the price you pay. What you are and what you do is wrong. A disease that only hits gay men, hits them in their sexuality. I mean, it, it was like the perfect metaphor for the homophobia of the whole society. And it did seem to me that reality is not supposed to come already packaged in metaphors. You know, it's like everything we gained was, looked like it was being taken away from us again. I still remember a relative in Europe, when they found out that I was gay, they just turned to me and said, well, AIDS will get you. The timing of it all was really eerie. So there is something uncanny about it. It's very Shakespearean, the way that this happened. To have this breakthrough, to get this incredible outpouring um, of support, of acceptance, of a community coming into its own, of demanding a, a place at the table, of having great success in almost every sector, and then to just be wiped out um, as if in some diabolical plan. Willie Brown actually said this to me early on. He said something to the effect of this occurring right now with gay rights just having happened would be like telling black people they have to go back to the back of the bus. When I went to interview the out of California case, I was very impressed with him. He, he seemed like an intelligent person. He was very well dressed. At the time, he didn't have any hair because he had just completed a round of chemotherapy. But he was very concerned about his condition and about the concern of other people as well. Uh, because many of his friends in New York City and even some in Canada had very similar symptoms to the symptoms that he was experiencing. And some of his friends were so ill that they had died. So he was very cooperative when I started asking him questions about his sex life. And I said, how about your sex partners? And he says, well, I can remember a few of them, but gee, I've had so many. And I hope you understand why. I'm in a different town every night. I'm a young guy. So I go out every night and I have fun. So he averaged about 250 different sex partners a year. I said, do you have an address book? A little black book. He says, I do. I said, would you mind sharing the names with me? He said, no, I'll be glad to. And he started reading me names. He read me 72 names before he said, it's 6.30, I've got to go. If other people had the same amount of information that he had, we probably would have been able to make many more connections and been able to have solved this jigsaw puzzle much faster than we did. Here is the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. In this report, there are no figures, there's no graphs, but there is reference to an out of California case. Everybody gets the idea that this guy, at that point, was the person who brought AIDS to California. That was sort of, it wasn't called AIDS yet, by the way, at this point, it's still called GRID. GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency, which made the whole disease seem as though it was the result of somebody's sexual orientation rather than action, some action they had taken, something they had encountered, a microbe. this hotline on Castro Street. And this patient would turn up. The minute he did, the hotline would light up. He's here, he's having sex with people, he tells them he's, he uh, has the gay cancer. By the end of the summer of 1982, Kaposi's sarcoma was summoning a huge amount of attention and upset in San Francisco. 
anybody with KS lesions who continued to go out would draw attention. And given that we know that Gaetan did not like to be told what he could or could not do, it seems quite likely that he would draw attention. Gaetan Dugas uh, was very comfortable going to various public health people to talk about his disease. He met with Selma Dritz, and according to Selma, uh, she counseled him that he should not have sex, that he was perhaps dangerous. And he said, you're not going to tell me how I should behave. I told him that he was getting other people sick with it, and he said, it's my right to do whatever I want, my civil rights. Yetan had uh, uh, different beliefs about, uh, about his condition. Uh, his approach was, show me, prove to me how this disease is transmitted, and if I'm doing anything that is transmitting, and I may acknowledge it if you can prove to me that this is the case. I don't remember what uh, triggered me to call Air Canada, but I did call Air Canada. I wanted to talk to the uh, medical director and um, find out if there's some way to limit his ability to travel. A doctor telling us we've got to start, you know, uh, watching what we do sexually and that there's, you know, it's, it's troubled and we gotta, you know, curtail our activities. I totally understood the f terror that gay men had about AIDS pushing us back into the arms of the medical establishment. It was only in the very early 70s that, uh, that uh, homosexuality was no longer seen as a disease. It was taken out of the, uh, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. And so doctors had always been trying to cure us. The flight attendant in 1982 looked terrible on chemotherapy. Like death warmed over, he had lost hair and weight. Nonetheless, Dugas' attitude carried him through. He was always hopeful and kept saying he would beat it. I can remember sending Gaetan encouraging letters. I have a card that he sent me in January 1982 when he's feeling depressed about the loss of hair saying he feels like an alien. 96% of all the people I saw then died. Smallpox, Ebola only killed 60%. And we were talking about virtually everyone was going to die. Had that been happening to any other group in the society, there would have been massive hysteria all over the country, you know? And in fact, what we got was total silence. It's more like what happens in a war, you know, where, you know, all of a sudden, a whole generation of people, you know, are put in this incredible danger and many of them die. It was such an extreme difference from people who are like 25 and look 25, and then in five minutes they looked 95. It, it's terrible because it's a slow death in a way, and you see the body basically decompose in front of your face. A beautiful man is turning into nothing. There's a fellow actor uh, named uh, Joe Capetta that became ill and died fairly early on, who was hospitalized, the food service worker, wouldn't bring his, his tray into the room, just set it on the floor outside. A lot of hospitals, especially outside of San Francisco, they wouldn't let the partner come visit their lover in, in bed as he was dying because he wasn't a family member. They didn't want you around at all. You, they were ashamed of you. And you did this to him probably. We were being vilified by the media, by right-wing politicians. I mean, we're truly vilified. But then we have to remember that there were mainstream figures who suggested putting gay people, people with HIV, in, in camps, um, tattooing HIV on, on our bodies. If the only way to stop, them, stop it is quarantine people. I, I don't think any, there's any way around it. I think they're going to have to do it. Lovers were thrown out of their boyfriend's apartments. Um, they were not allowed to go to the funeral of their partner who had died. Uh, it's, it's, it's really grotesque the way that people behave. You know, very much in the same way that in 2016, 
um, you said, who are these people who voted for that man? You knew who those people were back then in the 1980s. They haven't gone away. I mean, the Reagan administration simply didn't want to acknowledge the problem. It was said at the time, and I think it's true, if the outbreak had occurred in a heterosexual population, they would be all over it. But it was easy to marginalize gay men at the time and say, well, who cares? There was an interview done with Larry Speaks, who was the press secretary to President Reagan, where he was asked about the AIDS epidemic, and he said, what's that? Does the president have any reaction to the announcement the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta that AIDS is now an epidemic in 600, over 600 cases. Yeah, uh, over a third of them are gone. It's known as gay plague. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I mean, it's a pretty serious thing. That, uh, one in every three people that get this have died, and I wonder if the president is aware of it. I don't have it, are you? Do you? You don't have it. Well, I'm relieved to hear that. Part. Do you? You didn't, you didn't answer my question. Well, How do you know? Does the president, in other words, the White House looks on this as a great joke. No, I don't know anything about it, Lester. You, you, what does the we, president, does anybody at the White House know about this epidemic, Larry? I don't think so. I don't think there's been Nobody any, knows. there's been no oh, personal course, experience course. here, Lester. I checked thoroughly with Dr. Ruge this morning, and he's had no, uh, <laughs> The patients <laughs> suffered from AIDS or whatever it is. Patient Zero was clearly a very helpful person to us. He didn't have to be. He didn't have to give us the names of his sex partners, but he did, and that turned out to be extremely useful because it allowed Bill Darrow to contact those people, follow up on them, find out who else they had sex with, and construct the cluster. But then we wanted to see how far the cluster went. We only had information about Los Angeles and this one out of California case. So I went up to New York and I followed up on the 72 different partners that he named. The important thing was to try to show that there were connections between Los Angeles cases and cases in other parts of the United States. Here's the original drawing on a piece of, uh, yellow paper about case 57, which was the person later referred to as the out of California case, and a drawing showing connections to exposures with a case in 1979, um, a case, uh, case number 40. Um, here he is going to Toronto. Here he is at NYU. So here, case 57 is described as a 30-year-old flight attendant from Toronto. I lost contact with Gaetan for a while. The moment he, he left for Vancouver and I saw him once, he was running through the terminal and we embraced and we chat, but he had very, very short hair at the time. He had a few spots on his face. And I noticed that there was a fairly common theme that essentially Gaetan in Vancouver was the personage, the face of AIDS. And it just seems so ludicrous. There were stories that Gaetan was having unprotected sex with uh, other other people, and it, it was uh, he was reported that he was in the bars and he was going home with people and this sort of thing. And AIDS Vancouver felt like they needed to have some kind of response to address what what these rumors represented. I do remember specifically having a conversation with him about promiscuity and bathhouses and et cetera, et cetera. He said, you know, people just don't get it. it. Because if I was in the bathhouses the way they say that I'm in the bathhouses, I'd be exposing myself to all kinds of random opportunistic infections. I, have, I don't know much about it, but I learned when I did go to the bathhouses or have a lot of casual sex, I used to come down with things and they were hard to get rid of. So I just stopped doing it. He wasn't having casual sex. Good evening. I'm Michael Pappas with Channel 10, Gablevision, Vancouver. There was a recent panel discussion in Vancouver. On the panel were doctors and other men associated with the AIDS problem. An overflow crowd attended, seeking information and other advice as to how to deal with the AIDS problem in Vancouver. On the panel that evening was Dr. Brian Willoughby, who explained. AIDS, the, the disease we're here to talk about today, then, is a new phenomenon wherein people's ability to fight infection 
is defective. They had brought in a, uh, a person from the gay men's health crisis in New York City. What brings me here is our concern over an epidemic that is killing gay men all over the world. The doctors presented as much, I think, as they knew, and I, my recollection is they tried to be pretty scrupulous about what they didn't know. So one of the things you can do to decrease your risk of contracting AIDS is to decrease the number of different sexual partners. There was almost disbelief in the room that that was something that we needed to do because it was a New York thing or a San Francisco thing. It wasn't a Vancouver thing. The things we do know about it in terms of who suffers from it certainly suggests that it is some kind of infection. We, the panel, talk for maybe about an hour, you know, 10 or 15 minutes each, and then the floor was open for questions. See, last year, Congress gave us AIDS. This year, screwing around gives us AIDS. What's going to give us AIDS next year? This is my question. Can I, can I take this question? Screwing <laughs> around it doesn't give somebody AIDS. I mean, it does and it doesn't. In other words, every contact you have, you're increasing your opportunity of being infected if, in fact, this is a contagious agent, which has right. never been proven. I believe there's some kind of uh, test being done on AIDS in Vancouver. Attending that forum af affected my life very, very distinctly in as much as the concept of safe sex was introduced and I started to practice safe sex, which is maybe perhaps one of the reasons that I'm still here today. And probably the third or fourth person to get up had a French-Canadian accent. A man went up to the mic. I only saw him from the back, and that was Kata. The hepatitis vaccine, the new vaccine that is now uh, offered to gay men has been um, developed with gay men hepatitis. So therefore, anyone who would receive such vaccine could be exposed to AIDS. It was a little difficult to understand exactly some of the concepts he was trying to convey. But what I appreciated about his interaction there was that he was standing up for himself. So you shouldn't tell someone that AIDS or a symptom of AIDS because there is no specific reason why you should get in contact with AIDS with an infectious agent. It sort of took the tone, how can you sit up there advising people to have less sexual partners to avoid an infectious agent when you don't even know that this is caused by an infectious agent? which, on face, is a valid question. Like if you have a lover who had hate, and okay, you, don't have hate, and you don't have hate, what is the warning you give to people? All studies indicate that, and it's not everybody, so there is a, a chance of risk involved, but the majority of the people are fairly promiscuous. It wasn't my place to say, get him off the mic, but I could tell that we were that it was turning into not a public information session, but a, a kind of battle. Okay, speculation. But it got to the place where I thought, this is not really good. So I leaned over to Jeff Maines and said, you know, we need, you need to get him off the microphone soon or he will destroy whatever good we may have done over the last hour with these questions. It seems like there was a kind of a fear towards those people here that who could have the same thing, or if had the same thing, or if had the disease, you should fear those people, but you should, you know, not necessarily fear those people. And I think what was interesting about Gaetan's attitude towards that is that in a way he did not want to change his sexual behavior because there was no clear proof. And so again, I think because he was a, he was this target for so many people, he was say, he was saying to them, "Prove to me that this is how you get it, and then I'll change my behavior." But until you can prove that, I'm not going to change anything. I remember after one medical setback, holding him in his apartment and him telling me that he wasn't afraid of being dead; he was just scared of dying. He never expressed any great sense that life had been unjust. He just seemed determined to make the best of whatever time he had left. I thought it was very brave of him to still be working. He'd taken some time off 
and then he'd come back. I think that was, he came back for our last period. And when he did come back, he actually looked great. He was in a good mood, giggling like he always did, darling. Gaetan was having trouble making it to flights and he was booking off last minute because he was starting to feel too ill to work. More than anything, he wanted to keep flying. He didn't want to be booked off sick. He loved flying, that was his family, that was his freedom. We didn't know who would survive this or who wouldn't survive this. It was possible that, you know, things were going to work for him. And so uh, consequently, I just met him in that spirit and you know, we both giggled, and as we were giggling, I just, you know, uh, touched up his makeup because I could see that it hadn't been properly applied, you know. It was too cakey as well. I remember it being too cakey, more than not covering the Legion. He'd covered the Legion, but, you know, just a softer look. <laughs> that was the last time I saw him. I didn't see him after that. the success of the cluster study was the cooperation of Case 57, Gaetan Dugas, whose personal sexual network extended to a large number of men in many cities. For me, the cluster study um, is a very interesting landmark scientifically, because it really helped um, convince the world that this was a sexually transmitted disease, because here you have this cluster of patients who are connected by lines which reflect sexual contact. So this shows 40 men who were eventually linked by sexual contact by their diagnosis. And the person who connected cases from both the West and the East is shown in the middle of this diagram. And he has links to eight different men, four on the West Coast, four on the East Coast. This is the person that we called the out of California case. Later on, we tried to show these cases by early onset, and you'll see that this out of California case was one of two, four, six who had symptom onset before 1980. So he was an early case, but he wasn't necessarily the earliest case in this cluster of 40 different men. He originally was called patient 57, then patient O for out of California case. And that's the way it was shown and displayed to my colleagues at CDC. A few months later, everybody's talking about patient zero. And I don't know what they're talking about. Who are you talking about, patient zero? Come on, Darrell, you were the one who told us about him. I told you about patient 57 or the out of California case. Patient O. Oh, that was an O? We thought it was a zero. The zero lost the association uh, with out of California and then began to communicate other meanings, particularly the association with zero as absolute beginning, but one with profound consequences for how the term was subsequently understood. I think right now AIDS is nine parts politics and one part science. So writing about the science and the elegant genetics of the AIDS virus misses the point. The point right now is we're not getting treatments because of political problems and that's not being written about. I think it's important to say that until the epidemic started occurring outside of the gay community, that the mainstream media largely wasn't paying attention to it. You've got to remember that the problem here is that we're moving slow in a situation where the enemy is time, because the more time you give an epidemic, the more it's going to spread. In the early 80s, Randy Schultz was the only newspaper reporter writing regularly about the spreading AIDS epidemic. And I think I felt more of a responsibility uh, and a determination to report on AIDS, because to me, AIDS wasn't something that just happened to other people. It happened to, to people I knew and I care about. He felt that he was the only person 
that could report on this, that could deal with this and, and highlight it and show what it was becoming. Because uh, none of the other media outlets were reporting on it. I was very proud of him. He forced the Chronicle to let him cover it when virtually I, there was nobody else covering it, basically on a daily, weekly basis. When you go back to the history, the Alpha and the Omega of the AIDS epidemic is the Rock Hudson diagnosis. That awakens the public and really awakens the media. The media starts covering it. I think it was also perceived at the time that Rock Hudson was heterosexual, which he wasn't. And people said, well, if Rock Hudson could get it, I could get it. What happens then is a story of, of national failure, and it gets to the central thesis of my book, which is that AIDS didn't just happen, it was allowed to happen. And the band played on as a natural outgrowth, really, of the articles that Randy's writing at the San Francisco Chronicle. I think he could see that this was an issue bigger than a, what a daily newspaper could cover. Randy Schultz really went out of his way to um, carefully document in detail, in excruciating detail, the moral, ethical, and criminal negligence of the Reagan administration. Randy Schultz came to CDC as a newspaper reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle early in the epidemic and interviewed a number of us, Jim, me, and others. He attended virtually every AIDS meeting in the United States. He was always there and always interviewing people. I mean, I was probably interviewed by him dozens of times. He asked me a lot of questions about the cluster study and patient zero and so forth. And Randy Schultz did what any good reporter would do in tracking down patient zero. Well, here's a story of this guy that's coming to San Francisco and being identified, the, the hotline's lighting up, people are talking about him all over town. What journalist wouldn't try to find out who that was? I've talked to Marcus Conant about this, and he confirms that Randy asked him several times, was narrowing things down slowly, and then called him back and said, I don't need your help, I've figured out who it is. Schultz's interview notes are headed with a boxed inscription, Gaetan is patient zero. I remember the moment that Randy became aware of Gaetan and how all the charts came back to him. The researchers from the CDC were able to track down Gaetan, and through his cooperation, and he was very cooperative with the CDC researchers, were able to establish sexual links between 40 of the first 248 gay men who were diagnosed with AIDS in the United States. That's when I realized not only was he going to use my name and the name, names of other government employees, but he was also going to name patients. And I told him, no, don't do this. This is not a good idea. You shouldn't name patient zero. Randy responded, I've got to do it. The government's not going to do anything about this problem unless I name names. By using everybody's name in this book, and I use everybody's name, he's not singled out at all, I think I make it put the disease on much more of a human scale. The publicist working on the book a young woman named Diane came up to my office on Friday afternoon in tears saying, we're going to, you know, we're not going to get any publicity. Everybody thinks it's been covered. They don't want to cover it. They're seeing it mainly as an attack on the Reagan administration and on the medical establishment, the CDC. I panicked. I called up an ex-boyfriend of mine who happened to be a publicist, and I said, John, I know you're out of work, so you have time on your hands. I'm in big trouble. I need you to spend the weekend reading this manuscript. And he suggested the following, which I thought was extraordinarily clever. The band played on. The story of Patient Zero comes up on 11 pages out of a 620-page book. He's only mentioned in 11 pages. And he said, you pull this material, out, you gather it together, and you present it to the New York Post, a miserably homophobic newspaper. The story has everything they want. It has beauty, it has death. You know, he's an airline steward, and best of all, he's a foreigner. He said, they're going to eat it up. Randy hated the idea. I called him Monday night after talking with my friend, and he was appalled. And he said, you know, this is yellow journalism. I said, yeah. But I said, if we don't do this, you're going to sell four or 5,000 copies of this book, basically to gay people. 
it's going to have no impact, you know, on the media. It's going to have no impact on the national uh, medical establishment, and it's not going to do what the function of this book is to do, which is to put this on the national agenda. And he finally agreed, re very, very reluctantly. And we presented it to the Post, and they fell for it. It was like cultural judo, where you were using the strength of your enemy to get your own end. And essentially, that's what we did. I mean, he, pred he told me exactly the headline. The man who gave us AIDS. When I received this phone call, I just happened to pick up the phone in the newsroom. And uh, this young woman from 60 Minutes uh, named Barbara Drury, um, researcher, producer, I think was her role, um, explained that uh, they were doing a documentary and that one of the main characters in it was from Quebec City. And she needed someone to drive her to Quebec City from Montreal and to translate with the family. And on the way, she had a copy of Randy Schultz's book and the band played on. And that's when the true horror of the story was revealed to me that, uh, that they were preparing a documentary based on this book. And this book had evidence that the man who brought AIDS to North America, the gay man who'd done that, was Gaetan Dugas and that he was from a suburb of Quebec City. When I walked in the door of the house, it was very clear to me early on that this was a family who really loved this young man and um, who were very sorrowful about his death. And they were asking me, what, you know, what do you think we should do? I remember them asking me that. And, and I said, well, you do one interview, you're going to have everyone lined up here at your door. They were horrified when they learned that this book that was coming out was going to name Gaetan as the patient zero. Kai Babineau, who interviewed me, I mean, he asked me, had I ever thought of the impact it would have on Gitan's family and his friends? And I had to honestly say, no, I hadn't. I, th I can only say I think they must have had a really difficult time going through the bad press after, which I think is, you know, shocking. I, I mean, I find that to be a crime nearly. And his family must have suffered after his demise for a long period of time. I remember his sister, who was a dental hygienist, saying, um, you know, so that's the reward he gets for cooperating with the researchers. Randy Schultz was focused on showing that the institutions that had been created to respond to this very type of, of tragedy failed to respond because of the prejudice against the people who were suffering from the disease. And that was the motivation behind his book. By the time President Reagan delivered his first address on AIDS on May 31st of this year at that AIDS fundraiser here in, in Georgetown, 36,000 Americans were dead or dying of this disease. What a sad statement that is, that that many people could be dead or dying before the president will even give a speech on the subject. The Times, the New York Times, within the next something like 15 days, had 11 stories on the book, 11 articles in two weeks on a book that they had refused to review. The band played on, essentially broke the silence. That was the most important thing the book did. It, it basically cracked that wall of silence. But at the same time, Schultz engages in his own demonizing. And I find particularly unfortunate his demonizing of the Canadian flight attendant, Gaetan Dugas, whom he transforms in the course of his book into patient zero. And really, that idea of patient zero as a figure, as a popular term, comes from and the band played on. It's funny how much the patient zero narrative almost jumps out from the rest of the book. It does seem tacked on. It does, it does seem very opportunistic and very sensationalistic. My take on Schultz's construction of Gaetan Dugas in the book is that Schultz presents him to be someone who is completely uncaring about 
how his behavior might affect other people. It's an act of projection, I think, on the author's part. He takes his own anger and rage and bitterness, and he makes this character called Patient Zero. What Randy was doing was saying, yes, we are, you know, fucking ourselves crazy, and we are mindless, you know, hed hedonistically. You know, some of that is, a little bit of it is credible, and some of it is internalized homophobia, a real degree of it is internalized homophobia. There isn't any gay person who doesn't reveal this, and, did, and Randy certainly had his, his share of all this. So the idea that gay men were going out and intentionally giving the disease, it wasn't that. It was that sex was one of the few joys that people had in life. And so the idea, and it was very widespread, that whatever is causing this, I already have. And you probably have it too. This is the main reason why a lot of gay men didn't adopt and embrace safe sex practices when it came out. Because everyone believed it was already too late. It wasn't this dark, evil portrait that, that Randy came up with. There was one part in the book where he was at a steam bath with someone. And at the end of their sexual act, he said, I've got gay cancer, and now you're going to get it too. And that struck me as very unlike the Gaetan that I knew. Did Gaeta really knew he was uh, spreading something? Uh, I can tell you one thing. If Gaeta knew he, he, uh, that he was killing somebody by having sex with them, he would, he, he, he would not have done it. Uh, he, he would have stopped having sex with whoever. If he, if he knew exactly, no. That's, that's not the person that I know. Gaetan was not like that. He was charming and everything, but very, very caring. No way, there's no way he would have continued this. I, I didn't blame Gaetan. You know, had I become HIV positive, I, I, never went through a period where I blamed Gaetan uh, for that because at that time again I don't think people really understood and at the time as well it wasn't everything wasn't lumped into one thing it was you had Kaposi sarcoma and they were trying to figure out why some people had that and you had PCP and some people were and they were trying to figure out why some people had that and they hadn't connected all the dots yet that it was all one thing um, so I didn't I don't think I ever went through a period where I blamed him So the original cluster study, and there's a very famous graphic showing everything pointing to this one individual, really, I think, spoke to the general public that there was a, a typhoid Mary type syndrome, a patient zero syndrome going on. So the, here's the key issue is what's is sometimes called latency period or incubation period. It's the time from infection to when you get sick, right? So if you read the cluster study, the assumption there is the time from infection to when you get sick is of the order of two years. So, okay, two years, that's the time. So they constructed this diagram in which Gaetan is linked to all these people by having had sex with them with, within approximately two years of their diagnosis. Okay, so, okay, two years, good. Because no one thought at the time that this was a virus that takes on average 10 years to, to produce symptoms. When you see somebody sick with AIDS, what you're seeing is the result of something that happened 10 years before. And when you see somebody in their mid-80s, where we now were, it's the result of getting infected in the mid-70s. And that's true, that's what happened. So this was like a slow motion epidemic that had taken place in the past, and what we were seeing was a result of that. So this cluster is nonsense. Because if A infects B, B's not gonna get sick for 10 years. And if B gets sick within two years of A, then you know for sure that A didn't infect him. It's the opposite of what it appears to say. Patients here at Gaetan Dugas did not infect those people. That's not true. That's false. Dugas is at the center of a cluster of people who are impacted by HIV. That part of it is true. But if you move the dial over left or right, 
five or 10 degrees, you're gonna find someone else who's at the center of a cluster that just starts over again because of their context. If every individual had been able to recall the information to the same quality that Gaetan had and had been willing to share it, this image would look completely different. There was just so much uh, blaming of communities uh, at that point, the gay community, of, of, of course, or gay male uh, community trying to find an other. Otherness bringing it here from otherwhere, you know, and he was Mr. Otherwhere, you know. They had him picked for that role, and everybody leaps on it. As soon as you put that out in the air, everybody wants to believe something like that. Bad person brought it here from bad country, you. <laughs> and uh, hmm. That's where religion comes from, is a need for an explanation that doesn't exist. Um, so we can blame God, you know, or the devil, um, or in this case, um, some poor flight attendant. But the myth, the Gaetan myth, separates from the science. It's a whole separate thing, you know. It's not what it's about. It's not about science. It's about projecting ideas of sickness and disease and evil onto somebody, you know, just a scapegoating. It's, he's, he's a classic scapegoat, you know. And it's weird because nobody knows what he's being scapegoated for. Originally, he was the out of California case, you know, and then he's like the first man with AIDS or the man who brought it to America or who knows what he is. He's like the mysterious evil character. He's the scapegoat. Every society needs scapegoats. It's universal, right? It's a magical way of getting rid of evil. You put it on the scapegoat, then you drive it out and it dies. Takes the evil with it. I think the, the application of morality to uh, a disease is a mistake because it interferes with the ability to deal with it. Um, it's a scientific phenomenon. It's a, it's a human tragedy, no matter where it is and who gets it. First of all, the people who were religious, you know, Christian fundamentalists, whatever they were called then, um, they believed this was a punishment from God. They believe that. They believe these things. These things that they say, they believe. I mean, this may be, you know, a function of my own uh, personality, which is, I just don't care what other people do. I don't care. You believe in all this crazy religious stuff? Go ahead, but don't impose it on me. Anal sex in particular had been for so long demonized. The sodomy, we have, we have laws which specifically demonize anal sex. And then for us to have at great cost thrown off the shackles of that and then to see anal sex in particular demonized once again as the best transmission method for what became known as HIV. Um, these sort of realities have a terrible impact on self-image, have a terrible impact on how we, how we navigate our sex lives, let alone how a mass public takes up our sex lives. And I do believe homosexuality is a moral perversion. Uh, participates in every kind of bloody and filthy uh, kind of sexual activity. One of the terms I remember used a lot was general public. General public was people who were innocent of the kinds of practices that gay men were, quote, indulging in. One of the words I saw a lot in the media, one of the words that I identify with homophobia. Somehow gay men indulge in sex. Other people don't indulge in sex. Of course it was tragic when a young child got HIV from blood supply, but it was also tragic when a 19-year-old man got HIV from a sexual encounter. Patient Zero uh, was very helpful to us in a number of ways. One, he was very open about his sexual partners, which allowed Bill Darrow to do the work that led to the cluster creation. He also agreed to come to Atlanta to give a large amount of blood, thinking if anybody has a new virus, he has it. Well, for several years, we had a conversation between myself, Mike Warby, who's a molecular phylogeneticist at the University of Arizona, saying, let's try to figure out what patient zero represents. Was he really the first case? How does he tie into the early epidemic? So Mike Warby agreed to do genetic sequencing on some very early samples that we collected. I think it was Harold who said, you know, we've got the patient zero samples as well, and why not look at those? And, and for, for me, you know, someone who does this sort of evolutionary stuff, patient zero has never been a thing. It's always been clear that, um, as I say, he was just 
you know, one of lots of people who were infected. There has been an idea that he may have been the, the conduit that connected the early epidemic, let's say, in New York City to, to the West Coast. Well, it's not. His, his is sort of a typical New York City sequence, and there are other sequences, early sequences from New York City that are much closer to the West Coast uh, from nameless individuals that we're not talking about or making films about. And then when we did uh, generated the sequence from patient zero, we put that into the family tree and it just fell randomly in the middle. You would expect from evolutionary theory that if a, if a sample was the founder, that it would form a base branch to the tree. Um, when it doesn't, that means that it is not the founder. It was just an average, mundane HIV subtype B from the time. And with patient zero, Gaetan Dugas in particular, um, you know, I, I didn't realize until Harold Jaffe told me that he made a special trip to, to CDC in Atlanta uh, really just to um, uh, donate samples. I find it remarkable that this guy did this, and he, he's emerged into our consciousness as something special, in large part because he helped epidemiologists who were trying to figure out what was going on. Very unfortunate, because people interpreted that zero to be the starting point of the epidemic. And this person, who had nothing to do with starting this epidemic, was accused of being the source, which was never our intent, never meant to be. I think the, the, the crucial contribution Gaetan Duga made was his very act of cooperation in a moment of extreme fear when he's French Canadian, he could have been deported, but he's going to Atlanta when he's very ill. He's going to San Francisco to meet with this, the researchers. Gaetan Duga really was crucial to us understanding that AIDS was a sexually transmitted disease, and therefore he should be acclaimed as a hero of the epidemic of the fight against AIDS. The toll of AIDS is demonstrated on that memorial. Those people who died of AIDS were the guinea pigs who made our lives a lot better. People have to remember that this community went and supported all those folks, and this memorial is there to, to just make sure that they're immortalized. When those first five cases were reported, there were already 250,000 gay men infected with HIV, and by the time the virus was discovered and an antibody test was commercially available, there were perhaps 500,000 gay men infected in the United States, and the vast majority of those men have died. There's more than one aspect. There is a personal aspect of actual human beings who died, um, and then there is this culture that disappeared in five seconds. All the plays never written, the performances never sung, the books never written, even the audiences that never filled the seats. All the people we lost all of the older people who could have been mentors to me to show me how to get older as a gay man that I don't have. The gay men that I personally uh, lost and many of the gay men that I worked with at the airline were bright, kind, fun, nice people. They want the same things out of life that all the rest of us want. They wanted to have a relationship to be loved, to grow old together, many of them, and they contributed to our society in many ways. And it is absolutely devastating that we lost so many. I have this uh, belief uh, or theory, not that there's a big difference between those two, that 
AIDS is what caused gay marriage, you know, that all these astonishing changes in society's um, idea of being gay, I don't think they would have happened without AIDS. If you can stay in Atlanta and buy a house in the suburbs and marry your boyfriend and be a dentist, they do. So, you know, it turns out that the average homosexual turned out to be more average than homosexual. This is a surprising thing to me. It's something that has not been universally welcomed by gay communities. I know that. I do. I'm happy about it. Um, I won't call her my wife, but I'm happy to have a legal piece of paper. There's nothing more important than having someone in your life, you know, to be a witness, to be a partner, to be there when you need something. I always had so many friends. I never saw marriage as something necessary. But the older I get, the fewer friends there are. And so now I understand that on a deep personal level, what it means to have someone who's been a witness to your life's journey to be there with you to the end. And suddenly, here we are now with gay marriage and gays in the military, where they'd been excluded before. All of that happened, and the band played on played an important part in that recognition that there was a large number of gay men in America. But the AIDS epidemic was really the thing that focused us on the fact that there were large numbers of gay men, that your uncle, the, the bachelor, your, your brother, your son, maybe even your dad, was gay. It took 800,000 gay men to die for the American public to realize that homosexuals were a large part of this community. That was really the legacy of the AIDS epidemic. You know, now's the time to say what the impact was on, on his family and, um, and for his memory to be, uh, you know, uh, washed clean of this, you know, horror that was, uh, um, you know, put upon them, really. I went to see him in Quebec City at the hospital, and he didn't know I was coming because I couldn't say if, if I was able to get on a flight or not. So I showed up there, and uh, he's in bed. <gasps> Okay, then, okay, then. We 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 got some bone. And then he was very self-conscious of what he looked like, because he had those uh, sea the, the the purple uh, spot on him from the um, Achaeus. Yeah, and uh, so he's going covering his head. I said, No, 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 c'est correct. So then he said to me, um, Well, you know what? I will get a Dalmatian dog, and I'll take him running on the beach, so we'll look the same, like we're twins. Things, you know, he made humor, like he wasn't, yeah, he was, a, that's how I knew him, so. I, dis like, I decided to do this for Gaeta. Like, I just felt, well, this is my chance to really show him how much I loved him. You know, by coming forward and say, no, this is not true. No, this is not true. Uh, this photo, this photo, I think is probably the nicest one because he looks really sweet and he's just sitting there being sweet. This one was probably the most famous one. He's kind of in the air. He's flying. He's having a good time. He looks angelic. He's like this golden boy, you know, um, in the air. <laughs> And this is the one where he was trying to show his dick. He doesn't manage to get his dick in the picture. Uh, this picture I didn't send to Life magazine because another friend who has a great gallows humor sense said, don't send that one to Life. They probably don't want to see the murder weapon. So they didn't get this one. You have it somehow. That is all of them, actually. Uh, it's saying, je vous fais mes adieux, I'm saying goodbye. Je vous aime, I love you, and I'm waiting for you in heaven, basically, and get uh, Of course, the airplane, uh, the our job, and... Uh. It says, um, well, the last part is, will... <laughs> We'll see you in heaven. We'll see you in heaven. Poof. 
I can't remember the first part. That's age. <laughs> the first part, I'm, I'm saying goodbye to you. I love you, and I'm waiting for you in heaven. That's beautiful. And I'll see him there. I'm already talking to him. <laughs> I don't know what the legacy of the photos is. Hopefully they portray him in a positive light because uh, even though it's a, sort of a negative and a sad story, he wasn't negative or a sad person. Like he was very happy and, you know, funny and, um, uh, so I think the photos represent him kind of nicely, if you will. Like, he, he looks like an attractive young guy who's enjoying himself, and that's who he was.